Eddie and Sylvia Brown. The Eddie. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> The Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown Family Foundation have generously donated to establish the Brown Lecture Series here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And this lecture series has been in place for several years, so we are really grateful to Eddie and Sylvia for their generosity. Events like this would not be possible without, without our donors. So I want to say an possible to offer these events free of charge to the public because we want everybody to be able to benefit from all of the programs and special events of the Pratt Library. So thanks to all of you for joining us here in the Central Library. Thanks to those who are joining us uh, by uh, virtual programming. And um, I just have a few coming attractions I want to tell you about. We've got a pack schedule this fall. Uh, on November 7th, we're going to welcome back April Ryan. She's going to be discussing her new book, Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem. One Book Baltimore returns on November 10th, and this will be an encouragement to all of the Baltimore area 7th and 8th graders. The featured book is titled Furia by Yamile Saed Mendez, and she will join us for a special launch event. And then on November 17th, the Hackerman Best and Next series is back with Emmy award-winning television host W. Kamau Bell. So I encourage all of you to come back Come back, we've got programs. The doors are open. <laughs> now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the mayor of our great city, Baltimore, Mr. Brandon Scott. Good evening, everybody. Okay, we gotta let Jamil know where we at. We're in Baltimore. Good evening, everybody. All right, that's more like it. Thank you, Dr. Brown, and it is my honor to join us all here in welcoming the incomparable Jamel Hill to the greatest city in America, the city of Baltimore, man. Uh, my personal, yeah, let's give her a big round of applause. I just hope Roland asks you those questions like he asked me on, on TV sometime. I'll be yes, sir. <laughs> My appreciation for this woman uh, dates back many, many years. As everyone in Baltimore knows, I'm an avid sports fan, and I did not miss an episode of His and Hers, and I haven't watched Sports Center since her and Michael left the show. But it, that combination of sports and hip hop and pop culture really spoke to my spirit. That's my spirit language. And I know that I'm not alone in saying that. And I think. Uh, that's why so many people relate and respect you, man. Uh, you are someone whose innovation and talent aims to bridge what divides too many people in our world. And as I told you, I don't listen to podcasts, but I do listen to Unbothered. Uh, as a fellow little brother and foreign exchange fan, of course, Fonte and Ninth Wonders episodes are my favorite. But, but most importantly, I think the carriage and your willingness to step away from a table where you were no longer served or appreciated uh, when it was probably easier to stay and more lucrative to stay is another reason why so many of us are in awe of your black girl magic. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank you for coming to the Pratt Library, a true jewel of Baltimore City. I'm thankful to all of our Pratt donors who helped to not only put on events like this, but for what our branches do in neighborhoods for young people and families each and every day, especially uh, through the pandemic where the Pratt was a part in helping our young people learn. Uh, we know this week we found out that so many young people across our state fell back. But in many cases, Baltimore bucked the trend. And that we know is due in part to the great partnership here at the Pratt Library. And we know there will be more 
renovations and dare I say the new Pratt Library in my neighborhood in Park Heights to come. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Brown for always being fabulous stewards and supporters in the biggest cheerleaders of our great city of Baltimore. And we look forward to a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Scott. Um, it's now my time to introduce uh, Ms. Jamel Hill to you, but I really am just gonna piggyback on some of the things our mayor has already told us about uh, Ms. Hill. Um, as I understand it, uh, her passion for writing really started at a young age. And uh, she probably showed her great potential uh, and her passion for writing uh, as early as uh, in, in secondary school. Um, currently, Ms. Jamel Hill is a contributing writer to the Atlantic Magazine, and she is, as Mr. Uh, Scott tells us, the, uh, uh, she is the host of a podcast called Jamel Hill is Unbothered. Yes. She received multiple awards. She was uh, selected as Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists. And Worth Magazine not, uh, had recognized her as one of the most powerful 21 women in their magazine in 2019. Her memoir, recently released, has already been getting a lot of attention and positive acclaim as an empowering and unabashedly bold book. Tonight, she's in conversation with Roland Martin our host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered. So I'm going to turn the stage over to Roland Martin and to Ms. Jamel Hill. And again, thank you both for joining us tonight. All right. Glad to be here. Uh, mic's on. We're on. Uh, I'm black. I need some bass. <laughs> it's way too much trouble. Bass. All right. Gl glad to. Can y'all get him in the back? See, now, no, now there we go. <laughs> now they can hear me. And I still need some more bass. That's way too much trouble. <laughs> That's too much trouble for a brother. You got to hear us coming. All right, glad to be here. Glad that Jamel here wore a dress. Y'all, give it up. I just knew it was going to be tennis shoes, jeans, and a t shirt. How many t shirts you own? First of all, this is why you don't ask your friends to do events like this. Because then, why you want to start roasting? Like, I'm not going to. I didn't start roasting. I just asked. Because I knew you was going to come in here and, like, just ask the person. And, like, oh, I got, I got. Don't you have a line of t shirts? I do. I have a line of t shirts. Really? I'm trying to help her get paid. And she mad. I'm talking about it's t shirts. True. It's no about money. It's true. Jamelstore.com. I have t shirts. Support black journalists. Like, obviously, the mission of Roland and, and I. So, yes. But no, I knew I had to, you know, dress up a little bit. I was trying to sell some stuff. I got you, yes. Like, you, I know, got you know, you. I believe in making Listen, money. Roland, if there's one thing about you, is like you got at least five hustles going at all times. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's why you that's are right. my boy. That's right. Look, I done pissed off a lot of white people. I need to move to the next job. <laughs> I ain't got, I mean, you know that. I know. Like, you experienced that. Listen, uh, the, one of the reasons why I was very excited that you agreed to this conversation you like the busiest man in show business, number one, because you, um, you're doing an incredible job with Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm part of the Bring the Funk Crew. I donated. I'm in. Y'all need to donate to this man. And before we get into the conversation that we'll have about this book, do understand that having a black press is essential to a democracy. It's essential to the state of the press. So please, you know, I hear us as black people, we talk about this all the time. Nobody's covering our stories. Nobody is hearing from us. Nobody cares about our, pers our perspective. Roland is on this every single day. So please support him. So I want to start there because the thing for me, I've always understood freedom and flexibility. I've also always believed in or not believing in white validation. Mm. And there were a lot of people who thought you were absolutely out of your mind. They thought you should have you should you should have sh just shut up, sucked it up, stayed at ESPN. People told you what's wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, why, how dare you leave that good paying job? <laughs> um, but the reality is, no matter how much they were paying you, you were actually pigeonholed and you learned through the experience what you could and could not do. How frustrating was that? 
to make that money but to be in a box. Roland, you can relate to this story very well, but I can't relate to what you got paid. No, I you. I story. mean, I just... touche, touche. <laughs> okay, I got you. But you can relate to when you're at a network that is the destination job for everybody else. So just to give you guys a little context, and it's something I definitely write about, is that ESPN was never on my vision board of jobs. My dream job was to actually work in Sports Illustrated because I was a writer by trade. That's what I do. And so Sports Illustrated was that job. It was, it was, it was the New York Times of sports. It was. And so that's where I wanted to work. And so when ESPN came across my path, I was like, oh, it's cool. They're big. They're spending money. They're investing in journalism. That is what led me there because at the time, we're talking about 2006, and the story in newspapers, it almost feels crazy to say this now, knowing where newspapers are now. But that the, the end and the decline of newspapers were, was being strongly predicted in 2006. Ad revenue was shrinking. The, you can't have these two things happening at once. You have your ad revenue shrinking and your readers getting older, not younger. And so because of that, I said, you know, once I got an opportunity to interview at ESPN for a columnist job on ESPN.com, nothing to do with television. I said, this has got to be the move to make for my future to sustain my writing career. So it wasn't like I went there with some dreams of being um, along the pathway of Robin Roberts or Stuart Scott. That was not what I was thinking. And eventually, you know, moving up the ranks, fighting for real estate, going through the mechanisms of ESPN. Once I got to what should have been the opportunity of a century, that's when you see all the asterisks. No question, I made generational money at ESPN for sure. But once we started having creative differences on our show, which preceded the whole Donald Trump controversy, I knew we were Sports not. Sports in the show because his and hers. His and hers. Y'all had a, fall, a lot more creative oh, totally. license. Look, Roland, you served as my co-host. Rock the Escott on the ESPN. Sure did. Had to let him know. He had to let him, he represented all the way. And, um, that's why his and hers were so special. As, as my former co-host, Michael Smith, used to say, we selling tapes out the trunk. That was our mentality. Like, we master peeing this thing like ice cream man. That's what we're doing, right? But then you get shifted to one of the, the, the flagship. And when flagship or network, that means moneymaker. Uh, it does. I mean, it's the legacy show. It's the baby of the network. And a lot of people wonder, why would y'all move uh, twice as much viewership, three times as much money? <laughs> brand new studio that's worth a hundred million dollars uh production staff that triples overnight but then it comes at the expense of the say so all of a sudden like they didn't really know how foolish we were being on his and hers it's like they knew but they didn't know if they didn't watch it they didn't because you know what they liked all the cool things that we did on right. his and hers which were great i mean i drank a 40 on tv a real 40 right <laughs> It's like we did a come into America skit. We did all kinds of foolish things. Like we, we literally just broke every television rule, and that's what made the show special. And that's why it was a cult. Class. It was a cult hit among the audience. Yes, because we were doing that show for y'all. We were doing it for us. We were just being ourselves. We were like, listen, if don't nobody else mess with us, our people gonna mess with us, and y'all did strong. And so. Um, that's why we were able to bring in Roland Martin, the co-host, because if we tried to do it at our sports center, it'd be 2000 emails about it. Right. So we get to sports center. Oh, yeah, and we, I'm real scary. You to them, you would have been frightening. <laughs> OK, so we get in the sports center and it's just a lot of cooks in the kitchen. They don't know nobody know how to make a meal. And it was a tough thing creatively to balance. And one thing that Mike and I decided early on is that if we go down, we going down our way straight up like they're not never going to be able to tell us who we are on television it does not happen and so when we started having that infighting and everything um was happening and then the donald trump thing blew up you know as much as this job changed my life and as big as the limelight was i was like i really hate doing this like i'm tired of coming in every day and fighting to be myself like i just i just can't get down like that and so when i walked away People have to understand that I walked away knowing that it was going to be better for me mentally, knowing that like I didn't have to engage in all that silliness all the time. 
I did it because I wanted to. Because trust and believe, given what my contract said, they could not have ushered me out, right? And so I had the, uh, the equivalent of a no trade clause that an athlete has. And I had to waive that to get up off a of sports center. And it was mutually beneficial because by this time, the Breitbarts, the Fox News, they were all over me and ESPN. And so it was a breakup where no one wants to be the first person to say, we don't go together no more. I was happy to say, it's over. <laughs> okay, we broke up. <laughs> and the thing that when you talked about, again, that, that culture shift, um, that wasn't the first time that happened at ESPN. For all of the, the, the laudatory comments that they have today about uh, our late dear brother, Stuart Scott, Stuart Scott caught hell. They hated his lingo. They could not stand his language. Now, the audience changed their minds, but the reality is they preferred, and I never knew what the hell Keith Oban was talking about, but they preferred Keith Oberman and Dan Patrick to Stuart Scott, and he had to battle that stuff, and that's what people don't understand behind the scenes. Uh, the stuff that I had to deal with for six years at CNN, people don't understand the battles that we have to deal with, and you just see us on the air. You have no idea what happened off air. You know, that's, that's what I tell people, especially during that, those times, and it will happen when the network you're working for, they come into some crosshairs, right? They, they've done something egregious, and people assume that black people there are not fighting, and they have no idea every day it's a fight. And I'm glad you said that about Stuart Scott, who was one of the biggest supporters of Mike and I. He used to text us all the time and tell us, like, don't let them change you. You know, give us really great advice. He was like big bro to us for sure. And in a way, while it was encouragement, it was also a warning. Yep. And it was a term that we phrased about Sports Center. Like once the, there was an enormous management shift while we was on there that changed how they wanted to do Sports Center. Well, the, the leader of ESPN resigned. No, before that. Okay. So before the leader, John Skipper, who is the former president, before he resigned, there was another mini leadership change in terms of who was going to be in charge of our show. And we knew this person. He was also someone Stuart Scott dealt with as well, who was one of his main adversaries when he began to introduce Booyah and New Lingo and how we talk about sports. Right. He was the dude standing in his way. And suddenly he's in charge of our show. And I had the feeling this was not going to go well. But I was like, OK, we'll see what happens. And ultimately it played out just like I thought. We were the mobile quarterbacks that got the coach who only wanted a drop back passer. That's what we were. And it was very clear they did not want us. We weren't their first choice. They didn't want us. And they tried to sort of make it work. And a lot of things culturally started to happen with our show. We had a personality wall behind us on Sports Center that was supposed to be representative of all the things that, you know, Mike and I liked that we thought were, you know, really culture shifting moments that were personal moments. You know, Mike had a picture of him, his wife, his kids. We had a picture of when we were all at the White House when Obama was there, drank Hennessy in the White House. That's a great, Awesome story that I will, I will always tell. We have pictures of Biggie. We have always pictures. black people with a Hennessy story. Roland, don't act like you wasn't there. I don't, yeah, but I don't drink, so I ain't got a Hennessy story. He does that, but you was in the White House fooling like we were. Oh, now you know, I was in the ascot. Come on now. <laughs> so, we, uh, so we had all these moments on the, on the wall, the personality wall that was created for our show. And one of the first things they did was they wanted to get rid of the personality wall, not because of the picture of Biggie, not because of the picture of Mike and his kids or me having the picture of the Detroit skyline where I'm from. It was the Obama picture that they wanted to get rid of. Mm. Because at this point, ESPN was in these crosshairs of being considered too political and too liberal and what is going on there. And all of those chaos agents that brought that narrative about ESPN, which has never, They've never been polarizing, but they were during this time. And it was because the faces of the network started to change. Stephen A. Smith is becoming the face of the network. Mike and I have our own show. You have Bomani Jones, you have Sarah Spain, you have Kate Fagan. So what y'all were experiencing, which is my new book, White Fear, 
how the brown hundred percent and i read the book they mind and every that's that's when, when what it is has changed oh my god what's going on the world is ending where did all of our people go they couldn't handle it and no that's no but it's real like what you're talking about is real it's like they couldn't handle it and even though it was very obvious that the people who were accusing espn of doing this were only doing that because the faces change it wasn't they acted like every night on the 6 p.m sports center we were talking about immigration reform like we we were never doing that. It was a sports show. But you have, you know, you know how it is. It's like if they can sell a narrative about our show not being about sports, about black people being too political. One thing I learned, and I knew this beforehand, but I never really experienced this until I was doing the 6 p.m. Sports Center. People consider you just being black and showing up on TV as being a political act. That's oh, it. oh, it is. It is to them. It's like a political act. And I'm oh, yes. just like, all I did was come to work and get in the employee lot. That's but yet I'm representing, <laughs> you know, some statement about America because as you said, it's the fear. They see the change. And, oh, and, and, and it ain't like you had processed hair. Yeah. See, uh, see, see that, that you throw that in too. So, you know, no wig, you wasn't sitting here, you know, no, with, I had, with, with, a, know, with a flat. No, I mean, I mean, that, that all. I'm relaxer because it's still an integral part. <laughs> no, I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that the reality is this, even the idea yeah. of black women wearing natural hair or wearing braids oh, yeah, is real braids. new on television, like last two, three years. I mean, Mike was wearing Jordans on here. It's like he wearing Jordans, you know, we got pictures of Biggie in the back, like we coming in there like this is the cookout. Like what we would. That's that's what we wanted our sports center to be. But 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 this wasn't your first run in with uh, a clueless white boss. Mm -mm. I've had many of them. <laughs> Talk about the baby mama and how using those two <laughs> words almost got you run out of Orlando. It's true. But it, well, I, I'll, I'll give the kicker at the end. So uh, one of the stories I tell in Orlando, I, I was a columnist for the Orlando Sentinel it was my first columnist job. I got it when I was 28 years old. And Orlando is a well, very- First of all, what? the only black female sports columnist in the country. No. O only female, only female. No, the only black female sports columnist- at Daily sports columnist. At a daily newspaper in North America, not just America. No, but they clapping, but you were not happy. No, no, because that's embarrassing. Like that's a big indictment of the profession I chose to right. be a part of. I was one out of 405 and that's why one of the chapters is named that. So I get to the Sentinel, I'm 28 years old. I have to figure out how to have a voice, how to you know, structure a column thing because I, I hadn't been a columnist before. But anyway, when I was there, I created a series called Riding With. And in Orlando, it was a different kind of sports town than I was accustomed to. When I was in Detroit, they had all the major sports. You know, you got the, Pistons, Red Wings, you know, Tigers, Lions, unfortunately. I said that for my husband. Right. I, I knew she was gonna mention Lions last. I, I just I just said that for her my team husband. is the 49ers, by the way. That's right. But she rocked everything in Detroit. But, <laughs> but the Lions. Because I value my mental health role. Now that's why. You got Michigan, Michigan State, you know, it's 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 a robust college or a robust and we know, we know you're in Michigan State. I know. Look, a, look, a, look, a and M. You ain't got nothing to say. No, right? I'm not hating, but I'm just saying. I feel like your, your season this year been like mine. I know. We we in the same boat right we're now. We're in line, so we ain't we're, gonna bring up college raggedy. football. We're a little raggedy. We won't. It's okay. We will commune. Over we our raggedy. Way. We paying more than y'all paying mail. I, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you know, being in Orlando, um, it was a one sport profession in terms of professionals town they only had their orlando magic that's it so when the magic were done and when college football season was over because college football was very big there because you have florida florida state miami you know all of that and when those seasons are done you gotta fill news hole and so i came up with the idea to do a series called riding with where very simple concept me a videographer photographer we just get in the car with an athlete i ask him questions we tape it I write up the Q and A, we done, you know, and then do one every week in the summertime, fill in that news hole. So the first one I do is with a player named Willis McGahee, who was a star in Miami, 
Uh, I think Willis was a second or third round pick. He suffered a very gruesome knee injury in that Miami Ohio State game right. in the national championship. Sure, top 10 pick. Oh, he was before then. And yep. then that injury happened and he slid a little bit, but still had a productive NFL career. Willis is the first person on the slate to interview. I go down there, have a good interview. And me, I'm, you know, despite the fact that people like to perceive me as being very serious all the time, I'm silly. And so I'm in the car with Willis. He's got a brand new BMW. And I know he's got a couple kids by a couple of different women. And I ask him jokingly, what's worse, Willis, a baby mama or ex-wife, <laughs> right? And now everybody black watching the video was like, excellent question, Jamel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I felt like I was getting to the truth of something. Willis starts going in on his baby mamas. He's like, oh, they want too much time, money. Like, he's just going in. And it's funny. And everybody black watching, like, we yep, understand, I can, Willis. They can relate. So he says all this. It runs. It goes viral. What was viral for 2006? It's like all these blogs pick it up. And I'm thinking this is great traffic for the site. But there was Then you get a call from Karen. And then there was... <laughs> There was one person who was very unhappy about this, and her name was Charlotte Hall. She was executive editor of the Orlando Sentinel at the time, and she could not believe that we put the word baby mama in print. In did, the did, she look, did she look like us? No, I'm just I'm just checking. Look, I have to okay. ask these questions. That's true. No, she didn't look like us. Because she, she could be a, a cousin of Clarence Thomas. But go right ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's true. But but that's a fair point, though. That's a fair point. Oh, I can be real petty. <laughs> that's a fair point. So she did not look like us. She kind of looked like her husband might have been a founder father, but that's okay. Um, but Charlotte was incensed. She had never heard of the term baby mama. And this is the mid-2000s. Karen? <laughs> this is the mid-2000s. So... It's very much in the lexicon of how we talk, and it's everywhere. And I said, okay. And she was like, I'm going to put a letter in your file. She suspended. I think she suspended my editor for like a day, which was crazy. Just over For baby mama? For baby mama. She wasn't having it. So damn parents. one of my bosses on the sports staff told me, he was like, listen, just make this go away. Like, I know she's overreacting. Just apologize. I did not want to apologize, but I also like to eat. So I said, <laughs> I will do this. But, you know, as soon as I did it, I just didn't feel good. I didn't feel right about it. And I was thinking to myself at the time, I will never again apologize for something I know I'm right about. But, and here's the kicker. The kicker is there was a, a black executive at ESPN who saw the story because it went viral. And that same black executive who happened to know a friend of mine set up a meeting for me. Uh, you know, he asked our mutual friend, which, you know, I didn't even know we had. He asked to set up a dinner meeting in Orlando because he's like, I want to meet the young woman who wrote that because then I was young. And so he set up the meeting. He was like, you know, we have a, a sports columnist opening at ESPN.com because there's a guy named Skip Bayless who's leaving his column writing responsibilities, and he's gonna be television just full time, that's it, and I'd love to bring in your voice. So what is the lesson in this? Is that one Karen's <laughs> objection can lead to a come up, <laughs> is what I'm saying. So I got the job, and baby so, so, mama is how I wound up at ESPN. <laughs> so, so, when, so how did you leave? So it was funny because I, I mean I know how I, I you listen, Roland, you would have been I would have been like alpha. you probably would have been, been like, Karen, let me holler at you. <laughs> oh, it'd have been oh it'd have been real. Oh, bad. I know, I know. I would real have some baby mamas in the all studio. <laughs> oh, it would have been oh yeah. Oh you oh, let's be, I was like, Roland, I know how you get that. You gotta understand. I, you would have been stepping outside this one. I resigned office. a job on Juneteenth and left on July 4th. Yes, I did. I was like, freedom. <laughs> why, are, why are you like this? <laughs> I say, why are you like this? It lined up perfectly. It lined up perfectly. No, I, I didn't leave quite like that. But once, here's the funny thing. 
another story that I tell in there. So I go off to interview and, you know, I believe in keeping it 100. So I told my bosses, I was like, hey, just so y'all know, I'm going off to interview at ESPN. So I go off to Bristol while I'm there. The news breaks. And this is how I knew ESPN was a totally different world than what I was accustomed to. The news breaks on a sports media blog that I'm interviewing or no, that I had agreed to go to ESPN and I was making $200,000 a year. I was like, that's news to me. Like what is that? Wow. While I was interviewing, that literally happened. And my uh, manager at the time is calling me like, what is this story? And I was like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know, I'm still some, talking Some to op her. has leaked the story, but it is what it is. But, you know, long story short, I did not make $200,000 a year, by the way, much less than that. Um, but my bosses, they understood that ESPN was the current and the future. Nobody expected me to stay at the Sentinel. I don't even think I received a counter offer because they already knew that like you get a chance to go to some place like that, you have to take that opportunity. Of course. Of course. Karen had to get over it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Karen does not sweat it a day over this, but she might not. Well, actually, what I love about what I love about the book, uh, I love you name names. You ain't use all last names. Like what no. homegirl name? What's Karen's name? You, Charlotte Hall. I didn't. Yeah, use you, you put a whole government name in the book. Uh, but but some other folk, you just use first name. Correct. Uh, like when you told Henry to go f himself. I did. Um, and and so y'all gotta understand. Okay, typically when you see these interviews, they li people literally sit there and just recite the whole book. I don't do that because you need to buy the damn book. Okay, so <laughs> when, you ain't gonna get no freebie. Give all the good stuff away, then you don't buy the book. Now that ain't gonna happen. Y'all gotta read his third when she said that Henry can go f himself. First of all, I hollered laughing when I got to the line. I had to go back and read it two more times to make sure. Uh, but again, you, you didn't hold back on, on naming names. At least my next question, Walter Mosley, when I interviewed him, mm. uh, he, he came to the studio when I was in Chicago, and I don't read fiction. And I was like, Walter, I ain't read your book. He's like, what? I said, I don't read fiction, dog. And he said, well, what I love about a fiction, you can actually tell the truth more with fiction than you can with nonfiction. Mm. Uh, and he said, because you can just say, it's made up. When you really not really really true, he, he did. Yes, so when you were writing this, how did you? Because you're very open about a whole bunch of stuff uh, dealing with you, a lot of stuff with your mama, right, and your grandmother. Yep. Uh, so how did you not self censor, or was there, or, or were there some things where you said, "Yeah, I put a lot. I, I can't put this." Uh, I pulled a couple punches. And the reason I did is because the thing about when you write a memoir and you're naming real people, though in this case, uh, like you mentioned Henry, and then when uh, I talked about my abortion, I purposely did not name, I just, I gave him a different name. Because the one thing I wanted to be very careful and intentional about is like, I'm not gonna tell someone else's story, right. especially if I don't know if they've actually told this story, right? And so, you know, Henry, just so you all know, and I don't want to give away too much as Roland said, because buy the book and read the book. But Henry was a married man that my mother was having a relationship with. And I don't know if he's still married or whatever. You know, I'm not I'm not snitching. Like, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what his situation is. All I know is. This Except she said it was Henry who owned a bunch of buildings, who was a former professional football player. I was like, it's a lot of damn, Jamel. That awesome buildings. Like, you <laughs> unmasking like a mother. <laughs> You never know, right? And like he out there taking credit for me. You were like, oh, hell no. Well, the one thing I did tell about how awkward it, it was is when one of his relatives reached out to me on Facebook. And I was like, your dad clearly has not. Oh, dang. I said it was. I mean, anyway, your, your dad, they clearly have not said how they know me. But OK, anyway, it's a story for Bravo. <laughs> right? I say all this to say is that the difference with a memoir is that you're writing about real people and you have to think about what do these relationships look like after this book is done. Right. And so the one I was most, or the two I was most sensitive to were my mother, obviously, and to my husband, right? And because I certainly wanted to make sure that there was nothing in there that he didn't know, nothing in there that he was surprised by. Because certainly you could tell about your past and stories, but you may not go into the same detail that you would in a book. I pull a couple of punches. Well, or you just might not think about, do these details matter or not? You're just giving them the gist of it. So I wanted to be very cognizant of, of that part, but I also know, and thinking as someone who's a reader, 
thinking as somebody who's a journalist, and you know how much transparency is really the foundation of our profession, what would I look like considering the type of journalist I try to be, being inauthentic with the audience? So I was just gonna lay it all out there and let everybody make their own decisions and let the material do what it was supposed to do. What I wasn't gonna do is cheat people out of understanding the full scope of who I was. Because how many celebrity memoirs do you read if you want to put me in that category where you have the sense that they're not telling you everything? I didn't want people to leave with that when they read this book. Absolutely, absolutely. Which I think is important uh, because you're right, authenticity, I mean, that's actually what makes, what the audience actually wants today, uh, craves today. Uh, and unfortunately, we have a lot of folks uh, who, who don't actually uh, do that. Um, looking at the things that you did talk about and growing up, how you grew up, uh, you know, moving different places, what, what, what your mother experienced as well, uh, you really deal with that, that trauma and that pain and how it still is present today and how a lot of folk don't take the time to really sit down and go through Okay, what did I actually go through and how is that having an impact on me today? Talk, talk about why that is so critical to understand your past, have a better understanding of who you are in the present and how you can be a better person in the future. I mean, it's just like history, right? Is that the way you don't repeat it is if you actually know what happened and you understand why it happened. And a lot of us in this room are dealing with generational trauma. The only way it can be broken, I believe, is if you're very open about what that trauma is, about what's happened in your family or in your mm -hmm. relationship, those dynamics, you have to be honest about what's going on. And once you are honest about it, you can ad actually address it. And we know as in our community, what's one of the cardinal rules that we heard growing up, Roland? It was what happens in this house stays Same in this house. house, right? Sometimes, Actually, not even sometimes, a lot of times, it's not good for it to stay in the house. And considering the amount of sexual abuse trauma that my mother suffered, uh, the issues my grandmother had and um, other people in my family I talk about, if they had just been able to surface this in a way that they could deal with it, it would have impacted generations in our family. They didn't do that. And because of that, there was a scar and a through line that went from my grandmother to my mother right to me because of the inability to address mm -hmm. these horrors that happened. Like I, I met a woman one day and she talked, she, her mother was on her deathbed and her mother told her uh, that she had dealt with depression her whole life. And her daughter was like, why in the hell didn't you say anything? She says, here I am in my 50s and I've been dealing with this crap my entire life and you never said a word. And she said, well, I just kept it to myself. And she said, all of these years, I've been trying to figure out what is wrong with me. And, and, and she was angry, just like we've had, look, that, in a lot of our families, folks who have had illnesses don't say anything. Uh, and then uh, it, show, it shows up later. In fact, uh, in fact, I was um, Deion Sanders. Yeah. When he, when he had, his, had his leg surgery. Correct. Deion almost checked out because of blood clots. He, it was when his, his mama said, oh, well, you know, your uncle and so-and-so. He was like, how in the hell all the people in the family got blood clots and nobody said anything? I know. He said, don't y'all remember the part where they say your family history? Your family history. You go to the doctor and say, Do your, what's your family history? Correct. For many of us, we leave it empty. Oh, no, because a lot of times some of the, the older people that we know, our elders, they have been through such pain, they don't like to speak to it. And that's why one of the things I want you all to take away from reading this book is while your people are here, ask them about their lives, even if it makes them wildly uncomfortable. And as I was writing this, of the many thoughts that I had, one of them was that how much I really miss my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1929. I don't think I ever asked her what it was like to grow up in segregation. Mm. I don't think I ever asked her about, she told me some stories about what it was like to grow up in Kentucky. And she went from Kentucky to West Virginia and eventually uh, the family moved to Detroit and settled in a city just outside of Detroit called Ecorse. But I never asked her about that pathway. I, you know, I- A grandmother who, by the way, you're right, was, was brilliant. Brilliant, she was a G, you know, she was a big mama. 
<laughs> you know? And so the thing was, is that I, it was so much I didn't know. I mean, her mother, whose, whose middle name, uh, whose first name I have as a middle name, this made me so curious going to this journal, that uh, going through this journey with writing this book that, of course, I went to Ancestry. I'm looking up documents. I did not know my great grandmother was married at 15. I had no idea. And that made me understand why when my mother, when my grandmother lost her mother when she was a teenager, some of the emotional trauma she was carrying because she was still grieving and she didn't know it or she knew it, and, but there was just no time for it. Look, resiliency, resolve, all those things are great qualities. I know when people say, especially about black women, you're a strong black woman, they mean it as a compliment. The thing is, it's also debilitating. Yep. There are some things we are just not meant to handle. Right. You know what I mean? It's just some things that we, we shouldn't have to absorb, but we're told this time and time again, we're lauded for our strength right. of getting through things. Sometimes we need to sit in things I, I, and actually I, heal from it. I, I say on my show a lot, I'm, I'm sick and tired of having, and, and I've had this conversation within the context of HBCUs, of our black organizations. I said, I'm tired of having surviving conversations. Yeah. I said, I wanna be having thriving conversations. Uh, and it's just like anytime you see these conversations uh, where uh, single mothers come, happens and somebody brings it up and then somebody in Beverly stands up and wait a minute, my mama was a single mother and blah, blah, blah. blah. And, and, and then folks get defensive and like, well, no, I don't really mean that. And it happened to me once, I was like, no, no, we're gonna stay right here. I said, first of all, ask your mama if she actually wanted to be a single mom. Exactly. I said, you can stand here and talk to me all how your mama, your, your mama was strong. I said, I ain't met, there are very few people who have made a, a proactive decision, I want to raise a child like alone. I this life. Right. I said, you can talk about how strong she was, I guarantee you, there's some times when she was in that damn room crying and in pain. I said, so, we, we, I said, we gotta stop sitting here letting that become the norm right. and deal with the reality of that, that ain't easy. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Roland, because I do think that for black women especially, being resilient, fighting through, taking whatever punishment people decide to give us has become the norm. That we're not defined by um, what we achieve, we're defined by what we withstand. And there's a difference in that. And I, I just realized that you know, with all the resiliency the women in my family have had, there was so much pain there and I wanted to be an active part in just stopping that. Like, we gotta turn the page on this. We have to be different with how we handle these things. So that was, you know, to go back to a, something you asked me a, a couple questions ago, that was a big driving force behind writing this. Uh, one of the things that um, I wanna get into is, the notion of fun. Uh, there are people out there who have this assumption that when you're a journalist and you're covering these major issues that you know you have to do this here. Uh, and I remember we were at, I guess this was NABJ, may have been in Miami. You and I were twerking on stage. Uh, time, and, wait, time out, time out, time out, time out. This is how rumors get started rolling. We were dancing on stage. We were dancing, we, and were, we were not twerking. twerking. On stage <laughs> You know why I go? Because I can't twerk. Well, no, 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 no. I didn't say, no, I didn't say you were twerking well. I, like, I, I ain't say that. you were twerking well. I just said you were twerking. I mean, there are levels to twerking. There's bad twerking, good twerking, great twerking. I'm no twerking. I didn't want to sign one. I just said you were twerking. Listen, I'm, I'm literally Whitney Houston. I'm the black girl with no rhythm. That is me. Okay. We were, so we're, we're, we're sitting there <laughs> dancing. And, and folks were sitting there tripping on social media. And I was like, yo, you do understand. It's called hashtag live life love it. Amen. People, people act as if you have to be, have to be just locked in this persona that you cannot have fun. I keep telling them, y'all, you got one life. You got to live this thing. Yeah, it ain't all work. No, well, actually, I thought what you were gonna say is is 2018 NBJ when I was journalist of the year. By the way, an award Roland won before and was he's one of the the OGs of, of NBJ, and so. I remember us being on stage in Detroit as well. <laughs> Broly, you always on stage. That's what the common denominator is. Hey, look, hey, look, look. Everybody ain't got swagger. <laughs> Some folk got to be on stage. Some people got to be down there. If Roland is on the stage at NABJ, you know the party is, is really jumping. And so we had we had a blast. But uh, you know, I've told 
people this before is that I know people have seen me in a very serious light. They are looking at, you know, oh, you, the Donald Trump thing and all that other kind of stuff. But I'm like, I mean, I, I like to have fun. Like, turn up. <laughs> I like to turn up. Like I do a lot of the same things that a lot of other people do. But it's an important part of a release for a profession where we're constantly yeah. bombarded with sometimes the most terrifying information that we have to put in the context for people. So you asked, so when I, I was just on your podcast and you asked me this question, so I want you to speak to this. <laughs> uh, and that is when, uh, in fact, it was one of the questions too that came here. When young journalists come up to you, and I want you to answer, you already know what my answer Ooh, was yeah. on your podcast. I don't know when it's gonna air, but I just went in. When, when young folks, young journalists come up to you and they say, oh, Jamel, I, I wanna do what you do. Your, what do you? How do you respond to it? Uh, Roland, you had a, a, an amazing answer. And when I say, when they asked me that, I said, well, there's already one me. You need to be the best you. You don't need, and, and, and sometimes what happens too is that young journalists, understandably so, they're impressed by the platform you have, by the spotlight you've been able to get. And that's, you know, part of the journey. But I also tell them that, you know, I love this job now just as much as I did when I was working for the Lansing State Journal and making $30 Sustained. per story. Like, it, that's what it is. It's like, if you are only in journalism, especially for the things is, it can give you, you're going to be yeah, heartbroken nah, yeah, you, fast. Yeah, you ain't going to, that's not going to, that's not going to work. That was a Kobe Bryant video that was posted recently, I reposted, where he talked about love. He said, you got, he said, it's the love of basketball. He said, when you love basketball, he said, that's the driving piece. And that's it. Say, you know, people come up to me and say, man, uh, I see you, uh, you, you, you packing gear. And I'm like, yeah, because we got to get the hell out of here. If I help pack, we move out faster. But also I own it. Yeah. But the thing is, but when you love your craft, you're you want that shot. You want that like you you want to write that lead a certain way. That's the love is it ain't the money it's not, or being recognized in airports. Berlin, you know this as well as I do. When you were, think about it, when you were first getting into journalism, what did you hear about the salaries that journalists made? Oh, they said point blank, you, you're going to be making 12000 14000 It was 19000 when I graduated. Well, well, graduated, when you graduated? In 97. All right, I, so I graduated, so, okay, you graduated in 97, it was 19000 Uh-uh, I graduated in 1991. They, Austin American States, Statesman, offered me 20100 I told them, no, y'all got to pay me at least two grand more. Two grand? And I did. You fought for that two grand. And they were like, and in fact, the interesting thing is, uh, so Knight Ritter, of course, one of the big chains, Vice President Bill Baker was a great guy. He said, I really think you're going to work for our paper in Brayton in Florida. And I was like, what's your circulation? And I knew the moment he said the circulation, that was right there about 14, 15. <laughs> I said, say, Bill, that paper, I said, Bill, that paper too small. And he was like, I'm sorry. We, we're 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 too small. I was like, I said, yeah, Bill, my skill set. That's for somebody who ain't got my skills. Mm. No, I, no, no, because when when you know, because that that's gonna lead to my next question, which is understanding your value. Correct. So, and, and when I got promoted three times in the first eighteen months <laughs> and went from twenty thousand thirty four thousand, I said, Bill, I tried to tell you that was too damn small. <laughs> but you and know he what? said. Respect. You know what, uh, bro? I was, I had a similar story that that I did discuss obviously in the book is when so the News and Observer in Raleigh was my last internship, and I went there because they had this track record of, of hiring interns, and it was another writer on staff who was in sports. He was like, "Yeah, they kept me as an intern for eleven months." I was like, "Eleven months?" I was like, "Oh hell no!" I was like, "I am not about to be this eleven month intern." Because they can keep you at an intern salary, which I believe was four nineteen a week, and I was like, I can't do that. And but you said you couldn't do it because you knew what your skill set was, correct? And all the work you put in. Yes. It wasn't like you were just saying that and you were a scrub. No, and I and I wasn't gonna have the I'm just happy to be in the building mentality. Right. I said, okay, what will force their hands? So they extended my internship, as I expected. And when they extended it, I said, cool, I know I'm gonna be here another three months. I'm going to find another job. So I started sending my clips out to everywhere else, the Savannah Morning, Morning News, they had an opening at their paper and it was paying more than what I was making at that point. I went down there, I interviewed, 
really like the people there. I was like, oh yeah, I could live here because if I'm gonna go chase a job, I'm gonna chase one that if it all goes to hell in negotiation, I'm going to take the job. They sent in the offer. I came back to Raleigh and I said, hey, they offering me this. Y'all are still at this $21,000 a year range. And they're like, oh, oh, they were totally shocked that I did that. And so then they came back. Then a Samantha Morning News came back. And next thing you know, much like you, I did all you that. You like, what you got? I, what you, what got? you got? Oh, you got what this? You got? What and you much got? like that, you, I did all that for an additional $3,500 <laughs> in my salary. Hey, but it, but $3,500 is a It came in handy. But the whole point was, it was about setting a tone. Right. Right. To let them know that you just can't do me any kind of way. I know yep. my value. I know my worth. I have a different kind of skill set. And I'm sure, you know, I, I thank the dude that told me that he had 11 months. I was like, man, you changed my whole perspective with that. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that happened that was very critical in that time, speaking of negotiating power, but not just knowing your worth, you also have to know your development as well. As I mentioned to y'all, Sports Illustrated was my dream job. So after I got in the job and I'm a few months into this thing, Sports Illustrated comes calling because um, there was a friend I'd established while I was on the road in terms of like covering women's basketball and stuff. She, she saw my clip packet because what happens is when it's the NCAA tournament, all the uh, PR people for the schools in the tournament, they put out a huge clip packet. Because if you go to a tournament, it might be two or three teams there that you've never seen play. So they put out this enormous clip packet for journalists so they can read the stories that have been written about the team all season. Some of my stories were in there that were written about a team that was you know, really ascending. It was the North Carolina women's basketball team. She took that, she saw those clips, loved them, and sent them to an editor at Sports Illustrated because she worked for Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. and she was covering women's college basketball. Sports Illustrated called me. They had an opening to be a writer reporter in New York working for Sports Illustrated. Now, I know this job sounds very glamorous, but here were the details of this job is that essentially you fact check the articles that are in Sports Illustrated. And if you are, you know, if you are motivated enough, if you are driven enough and you pitch them stories and they decide to run it and, you know, you can report on it, maybe that could happen. So I'm looking, you know, I've been reading Sports Illustrated for years and I know all none of those writers came from the writer reporter track. And I'm like, hmm. OK, well, I'll go to New York. I had never been um, to New York City. They put me up. It's great. And I get the job. They offer me the job at the end of the interview. And the interview, I think the job was paying $42,000 a year to live in New York City. So basically, I would have been sleeping on the subway <laughs> unless I wanted a uh, apartment with 12 roommates. Right. I was like, what? That math ain't math. It. But it was Sports Illustrated. This is my dream job. And, you know, I thought about it. Uh, I would say, OK, let me think about it. You know, let me figure out what I want to do. And I'm like, let me get this straight. I'm writing basically every day at the News and Observer. I've already won the State Press Association Award for Best Sports Feature for a story I did on the Citadel's first female athlete. I am able to pretty much write what I want and whenever I want. And I have to go to Sports Illustrated. Uh, to get to Sports Illustrated, I have to fact check somebody else's stories that aren't mine. And maybe if I'm lucky, if the leprechaun is shining on me in the right way, I might get a byline in Sports Illustrated at some point. And I said, can't do it. Right. Cannot do it. And so I told the. So you weren't all focused on oh, it was Sports Illustrated. No, because a lot of you mentioned about younger yep. journalists, a lot of younger journalists. And I would just say young people in period, regardless of the industry. You all think bigger is always better. Nope. If they're not going to develop you, if what you want to do there, if you look and see who does those same things and none of them are in the position they're trying to bring you in on, maybe you need to rethink something else. Because at ESPN, for example, there was a lot of production assistants that were really unhappy because they wanted to be on air, go somewhere making $10,000 to be on air every day because guess what? Nobody on air right now was a production assistant. They all came from somebody else. Hello. Right? They all came from someplace else. So, like, you're just setting yourself up to fail. So, I was not going to be the person up in Sports Illustrated, not writing, fact checking, just to say I was at Sports right. Illustrated. So, I turned them down and I told them that. And I'll never forget the, um, the editor in charge of these positions told me, he said, 
I actually think that was a good decision. He said, we can afford you now. I have a feeling we will not be, afford be able to afford you later. And you say I had to bounce. And I was like, nah. So I stayed in Raleigh. And then my next job at the Free Press, I got a $25,000 pay raise. It was everything. <laughs> to live in Lansing, Michigan. You Bro. know what I'm saying? Oh, I was like, oh, oh, oh. that cost of living was oh, in there. Oh, you were balling. I was uh, balling. I, 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 do, I do love being petty. Oh, uh, here we go. No, no, no. I, I, lo I, I love when there's somebody in your past who, who said you would not accomplish certain things. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go so, so many places. Uh -huh. You know, and I have no problem reminding those folks of that. I mean, I did hit a couple of people when I got into the NABJ Hall of Fame in December. Mm -hmm. and then Saturday when I go into the South Pressure Journalist Hall of Fame. I've hit some folk like. Uh, Remember when you said? No, you, I, I'm being real petty. So <laughs> for you, but and, but but also it's a driving thing. If you want to if you want to understand the king of petty, watch Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame. Speech. Oh yeah. <laughs> People were mad. I was like, that's the kind of speech I'm talking about giving. So for you, is is there one or two folk in your life where? When you look at the stuff you're doing now with your podcast at the Atlantic and producing other uh, stuff you're doing with LeBron, all the different things you're sitting there going, I told you, I told you. So, I mean, here's the thing. There, there's going to be people like that literally throughout your career. But there is, I mean, there are a couple people that, you know, I, I know that especially when I got my columnist job in Orlando, that they really hated on me and hated on me to my boss on top of that. They didn't even work mm -hmm. at the Orlando Sentinel. But I'm a deeper level than petty because then the extra petty part of me can't even give you the acknowledgement that you did that because I know it would be it would be oxygen to them and I can't do it. So oh, I want I want them breathing. <laughs> I want You're like I want them breathing the hate. I want them breathing. I was like, I can't do it though. Really. Huh? It's like I, I my spirit will never let me allow my spirit will never let me platform somebody who just ain't important to me it just i just they're just not important oh no they're not important yeah I, I, you know i'm gonna tell you off air when i tell you off air who it is see you, right see you gonna see, fall out see, see, she nice she nice <laughs> i, know, I named sorry you. i just every I time do i do it. something in my career i want jeff braun watching <laughs> he named a first and the last roland do you know jeff his middle braun, name i mean <laughs> Jeff Brown was the news director at KBTX in Bryan College Station, Texas. And they had, I was an intern, and they had a sports, weekend sports anchor job open up. And remember, I went to communications high school, so I'm already far above. Straight up, one of his friends came to me and said, he is not going to hire, he will not hire black men. Mm. Came to me and told me that. I immediately, I was like, ain't no one hell I'm staying here. And I matter of fact, when I was on the team covering the public national convention, the Austin American Statesman, was only out of college seven months. I ran into him. I'm like, what up, Jeff? Oh, bro, what are you doing here? Covering public national convention. <laughs> Just graduated. So every time something happens, Jeff Braun. <laughs> B R A U N. <laughs> and then give the spelling. Now, Still no, working oh, in no, Dallas. No, but, but, do I'm, know, I'm, I, I, but do know this, though. You Roland. put first names. When Roller writes this memoir, I'm putting middle names, last names, Roland date of like, first. This the address. This way you can find them. But here's the thing. You know, I'm definitely one of those keep that same energy, right? So trust me when I tell you, if I saw this person in public, Roland, keep your location on because I might need bail money. Oh, ain't just, no problem. Just know, just know that ain't, if I see them in person, ain't no problem. It is on. <laughs> oh, like I'm waiting for the confrontation. You got to text me. I'm gonna text you. I'll be like, Roland, it's about to go down. Uh, Have your TMZ wallet. follow Jamel at all times. <laughs> I do a special I, from jail. For Roland Martin Unfiltered. Oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I know enough attorney generals and DAs. You, you ain't going to be spending no time in jail. Tell your people got to have you. That's it. Uh, unfortunately, y'all, all they gave us was an hour. Time is up. You should get Jamel Hill's book, uh, Uphill. It's uh, absolutely a fascinating book. It is an easy read. And let me say, right now, some of y'all might, oh my, let me eat. Easy read means in, in our business, writing is about rhythm. And when you read, you should be thinking the same way with music. So when you're reading a book, it's just flowing. So you can just go from one page to the next. You can knock it out in two or three days because it flows like that. And so other books like Staccato, you like, this is giving me a headache. 
Uh, I, I read a Peggy Noonan book. It took me about three years to finish that book. And, and by the way, I would say the same about Roland's book, Wife Here, because when I had you on the podcast, I mean, I probably read that in maybe two and a half days. Like it was, it was a very good read, very to the point. And most importantly, now, as we are thinking about pretty much our democracy dying right in front of us, it's a very important and crucial. Absolutely. Uh, and so I want to give your book a shout yeah, out I'm just saying, you know, Pratt, y'all can call, call a brother back and come back. <laughs> Eddie, I mean, you got a little pool. <laughs> I'm just saying, Eddie, it's your lecture series. You gave him the money, Eddie. Oh, I ain't, go I ain't got a problem. Let's go ahead and put it I out there. I think the audience is figured it out. Yeah, I think out. we figured it out there. So, <laughs> all right, y'all, uh, that is it. Put your hands together for Jamel Hill. Thank you. You a fool, bro. And of course, we were live streaming this on the Black Star Network. Uh, so all the folks who are watching uh, the network, we appreciate it. Y'all get the book as well. Uh, available at all bookstores. Uh, and then if you run into Jamel, she, you can sign her, she can sign your book and hopefully she'll have that person who was uh, tripping on her. Y'all can get that good video. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Holla!